The following interview was conducted with Herbert L. Thacker, interim head of Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab and professor of veterinary path pathology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October 7, 2010, Stewart Center in the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Thacker. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Well, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years and siblings. Um, I was born and grew up in Greene County, Indiana, uh, actually near Worthington. Uh, we were on a farm, a uh, family farm at that point in time. I had two sisters, one older and one younger. Uh, early on we had Angus cattle and they came through with uh, Brucella testing and uh, we had a number of those cows that tested bad, uh, that tested positive for the disease and so dad had to sell them. So we raised turkeys for one year. We had 1,500 turkeys and uh, that was an experience. They were out on range and uh, keeping the fox out of them and we literally slept with them for a period of time. At that time, most of the turkeys were sold about Thanksgiving and so it was about, uh, it was in November when we sold them. And then we put in a dairy operation and uh, we started milking cows and uh, we milked about 30 to 35 cows, and uh, we uh, put up hay all summer and fed it all winter. And uh, then in, uh, when I was a senior in high school, um, my dad said, well, he said, we could either uh, get some more equipment maybe and maybe rent some ground or you could go to college. And so I decided to go to college and uh, came to Purdue and went into pre-veterinary medicine and uh, applied to veterinary school and was fortunate to get in in 1960, 50, no, 1960 and then graduated in class of 65. Okay, yeah. yeah. Tell, us, let's back, tell us a little bit about high school and uh, what, were there any teachers or some of your programs and stuff and then a little bit about college at Purdue, life at Purdue uh, when you were here. High school was uh, was very good for a small school. Um, I thought my high school experience in Worthington High School, which has now been consolidated, so it's part of the White River Valley um, consolidation now. Uh, but it was Worthington High School at that time, and uh, it was uh, it was a very um, productive time. Uh, I, I got a very good high school education. Um, Mathematics. When I when I got to Purdue, I was I felt that I was very competitive with with the other people in my class who had gone to much higher high schools. Um, one thing I had an opportunity to do but didn't I didn't take any foreign language in high school. Um, that would have probably been probably would have been good. Um, but other than that, it was uh, for a small high school in Southern Indiana. It was an excellent experience and right. uh, very well prepared to come to Purdue and, and things worked out pretty well. How did you happen well. to select Purdue? Was that your, your top well, choice? Well, I oh. wanted, I had a, uh, when we had a dairy farm, we had a veterinarian at, uh, in Worthington and uh, his name was Dr. Andy Gray. And Andy was, uh, he was a big influence on my life really. And after seeing him and uh, he used to, he used to call me up at night when I was in high school and say, uh, "You want to go on a call?" And so we'd go on a we'd go on a call to well, that treat a, a nice cow or what? Companion, with, you know, worked. Pardon me. Going as a companion, going along with them. Absolutely. And so uh, we had an opportunity to do that in high school, and I decided, well, and at that point in time, Purdue Veterinary School was quite new. Right. Um, so when when I was in high school, there was not a veterinary school yet at Purdue. That veterinary school started in 1959 right. and in the fall of 1959 and I graduated from high school in the spring of 59 but at that point in time I knew there was going to be one so I decided that uh, I would try to get into that school and did and so that's why I decided to come to Purdue. Right. Obviously this is the only school with a veterinary college right. in, uh, in the state of Indiana that's right. so that's why I came to Purdue. Okay. Tell us about campus uh, when you were here. Did you, uh, uh, any, stu any student clubs that you belonged to? And did you live on campus or a fraternity? Or? I almost had blinders on at the time I was, came to Purdue because I had 
one aspiration, and that was to get into veterinary school. So I, I, I lived in a co-op house. It was called Stella Brothers at that time. There were 28 of us lived in uh, in this co-op house. Where was, it we, lo where was it located? It was located on Mar Stellar Street. Oh, okay. And I guess that's partially why it was called Stellar Brothers. And uh, <laughs> we had a house mother, and 28 of us lived in there, and we did the work in the house. Um, a number of years ago when my uh, mother passed away, we were looking away at some of the things that she had saved, and she saved one of my house bills. My house bill for a month of room and board was $30. So that, <laughs> that was a good it's saving. A it's a little different than that now. <laughs> we and, put it uh, in the perspective of those days. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. right. Yeah, so I lived in that co-op house, which was just up a street from the sure. vet school. Right. And uh, and then I lived in the co-op house during the first year when I was accepted into vet school. And the second year I took a job working in the vet school and uh, I had a room. There were, there were some rooms in the vet school that were set up very much like the rooms in the dormitories. Okay. I think there were about five of them. And so there were about 10 of us lived in the vet school and we worked in the vet school in exchange for staying mm -hmm. there. Sure. They had a kitchen there that we could uh, prepare meals in. But the third year, uh, in addition to living at the vet school, I, I was, uh, went to work in uh, the Alpha Z Delta house, uh, washing dishes and serving meals in the sorority house, and that's where I met my wife, really. Oh, okay. So that worked out pretty well. Sure. Uh, what what building did uh, uh, when the vet school first opened? Is the main building as it is today? Is that where the class? Where yes, was it was okay. added on to in 1996. Okay. But the original building is uh, it's still there. Still it was there. It's right at you. Very head. well planned. Uh, the building is still very functional. There's going to be some major renovations going on in the building pretty shortly because the vet school is going to go from 70 students up to 84. Yes, so, I did read that. Right. Uh, uh -huh. There's major renovations to the original Lynn Hall are going to take place. Right, okay. Then after you finished, uh, what, came, what came next? Uh, graduated from vet school in May of 1965, and I graduated on Sunday and uh, loaded up into a 1963 Corvair and went to Camelsville, Kentucky and went to work Monday morning. Uh, was working in uh, mixed practice there and uh, I, had, uh, I had every other Wednesday afternoon off. Other than that it was, it was pretty well working. Well, no, every other Wednesday afternoon and every other Sunday. I uh, worked every other Sunday, but we worked every Saturday, and, uh, and it was... Uh, it was quite an experience. We got a lot of experience yeah. in a hurry. Were you married at that time? No, I wasn't married the first year I was out. Um, my wife, Rita, was, uh, was still finishing up at Purdue. Okay. So she graduated in class 66. She graduated in May, and we got married in September sure. of 66. Okay, good. And then she came to Kentucky and... Uh, we were there for uh, until 72. Okay, and then is that when you came back to Purdue? Came back to Purdue. Uh, okay. We had a son in 1971, and by that time I had, uh, I had changed practice. I bought a practice in Cynthiana, Kentucky. And uh, I was in partnership at that time with, with Dr. Sid Granis, and uh, our son was getting to be about a year old, and uh, he was in bed when I went to work in the morning, and when I got home at night, he was back in bed, and I thought, I don't think I like this. And so I was at the Purdue Fall Veterinary Conference, and uh, I ran into one of my old pathology professors, and he asked me how things were going, and I said, well, fairly good, the practice is doing okay, but I said, it's running me instead of me running it. And he, he just off the cuff said, Thacker, why don't, why don't you come back to graduate school? And uh, I thought about that and thought about that going back to Kentucky. And I thought, you know, that, that might work out. So I contacted Purdue again and to see if there was any possibility of getting back into, getting into pathology. 
And they said, yeah, we've got, we've got an opening if you'd like to apply for it. And so I, I applied and uh, came up and talked to uh, Dr. Tony Galena at that point in time. And he had been a practitioner uh, in Ohio for quite some period of time before he came back to be a, a uh, graduate student and, and a pathologist. And so he kind of knew what I'd been going through. Sure. So we kind of struck it off pretty well, and uh, I came back to graduate school in 1972, and uh, and it worked out pretty well. Good, and you've been here ever since. Been here yeah. ever since. Uh, let's talk about uh, your when you got on the faculty then. About is that when you finished '76 and you came on the faculty? Came on the faculty okay. in 1976. I finished a PhD, and at that point in time in pathology, uh, a lot of the pathology uh, graduates um, were being employed by uh, drug companies to do drug safety evaluation. So um, when experimental drugs, before they were taken or given to humans, they were put into animals and then the pathologist would look for any lesions in any of the tissues. So that's that's where most of the veterinary pathologists at mm -hmm. that point in time were being employed. And I had talked to uh, Dr. Uh, Glenn Todd, who was the head of the pathology division down at Eli Lilly, and he had offered me a job when I finished my Ph.D. I didn't have it finished yet at the time that he and I were talking, and uh, I told him, yeah, I, I thought that was a pretty good deal, that uh, I'd finish my Ph.D. and go to work for Lilly. Well, in the interim, uh, Dr. Wayne Kirkham was a director of the diagnostic lab at Purdue, and he, uh, he came and said, uh, Doctor, we'd like for you to stay on here as a pathologist after you finish your Ph.D. And I thought about that a while, and uh, I called up Glenn Todd, and I said, Glenn, I'd like to go out to dinner with you. So I drove to Greenfield and uh, picked up Glenn, and we went out to eat, and I said, Glenn, usually what I've told people I was going to do, I did it. But I said, I told you I was going to do something that I'd like to back out of. I'd, I'd like to, instead of going to work for Lilly, I'd like to stay and work at Purdue. And he said, well, Thacker, I thought that's what you were coming down here to tell me. So he wasn't surprised, I guess. So I went to work in a diagnostic lab as a diagnostic pathologist in 72, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. Or no, 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 76. And uh, at that same point in time, I had the good fortune of passing the American College of Veterinary Pathologists e uh, examination, which is uh, which I look back over my life. That was one of my prime accomplishments, I thought. And uh, so I'd passed that exam and had a job at Purdue, and and at that point in time we had two sons, and so things were. Working out pretty well. On the upgrade, well. right? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk a little about your research areas: uh, avian diseases and swine diseases. Most of my and research, of, yeah. um, after I took the job at the diagnostic lab in '76, uh, I went into looking at uh, diseases involving uh, swine, uh, gastrointestinal tract diseases. And the one disease that we looked at probably more than more than any other was necrotic enteritis that uh, is uh, is now caused by a Campylobacter organism. One of the frustrating things we found on this was we could uh, we could see bacteria in this, but we couldn't get it to grow in the laboratory. And so I had about three different graduate students working on this, and um, it turns out that this organism just won't grow outside of uh, living cells and so uh, but we we opened some doors scientifically with it Good. and and um, then in uh, 85 um, Dr. Farrell Robin or uh, yes Dr. Farrell Robinson was uh, retiring as a director of the animal disease diagnostic lab and they came and asked me if I would be the director and I did and uh, so from 85 until 2000 Eight, 
I was director of the animal disease diagnostic lab. Okay, tell us a little bit about that uh, for the researchers. It serves as a, is it a major referral center for the diagnosis and treatment? Yes. Is that within the school or within the state or what's the lead? It's, um, it's under the academic jurisdiction of the veterinary school. Okay. But the funding for the animal disease diagnostic lab comes as a, as a separate line item from the state legislature. Okay. Um, is that which is a bit unique okay. because most all of Purdue comes in as a, bit, a chunk of money for um, primary right. teaching students. And this um, little entity in the, over on the veterinary campus is, is funded as a separate line item in the, in the uh, state legislature. And the assignment of this is to provide diagnostics for animals most of those animals come from Indiana. Okay. We get some from other states, Michigan and Ohio, Illinois, some from Kentucky, but most of them are animals from Indiana. Okay. And the operation of the laboratory is subsidized by state taxes. Now there are fees charged for, for the people to bring animals under? in, but those fees don't cover what it costs to run the test. There's a good reason for that, that being that um, if all the fees were covered by the charges, then probably farmers or others who uh, take care of animals in the state might not be able to afford to get the test run. And if that were to happen, then we wouldn't know what diseases were in the state. Right. So lose we, tried to keep, we tried to keep the fees as low as possible so that we got as many animals as in as, as uh, the owners would uh, bring us, right. and uh, so that we had some idea about what disease are in the state. Right. That was a good thing because there are new animal diseases. In the early 90s, there was a disease showed up in northern Indiana that uh, um, porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome, PERS virus, and we recognized that this was something new. I mean, these animals were coming in from one county in particular there, and we said, this is not like something that we've ever seen before. So we started looking for this, and, and it turned out that this disease also showed up in other places. And fortuitously enough, uh, the uh, scientists in the Netherlands isolated the virus before we did, so we weren't the first to find it, but we were looking for it. And right. so... So you had a source, and that's helpful. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Do you actually do you do the uh, diagnosis here on campus, or do you go on site at all at any time? We do both. People? Oh, okay. We do both. Most okay. of it, most of it is done by animals brought to us. Mm -hmm. But if um, if there is a need by a referring veterinarian that thinks that uh, perhaps we can see more by going on mm -hmm. the farm and seeing what kind of environment the animals are in, we make mm -hmm. we make farm visits. Okay. Now. Um, what is, do you have a liaison with the state veterinarian and Indiana State chemist? Is there? Excellent, okay. yes. Okay. Um, the Indiana State veterinarian is, over the years, we've just had excellent uh, relationships with, with them. Um, Where does she not, fit in within the uh, government? The state veterinarian actually is appointed by the governor okay. at the suggestion of the State Board of Animal Health. Okay. Um, now, during the time that I was director of Diagnostic Lab, I was an um, ex officio member on the Board of Animal Health. And um, the state veterinarian essentially does the policing of animal diseases in the state. The Diagnostic Lab does the diagnosing. Okay. And those lines were pretty black and white drawn. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't try to invade their turf and they didn't try to invade ours and we just had an excellent working relation, still do. I, I'm, it, it's still an excellent relationship between the state diagnostic lab and the uh, state veterinarian's office. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were very fortunate we didn't have state veterinarians in there who were trying to protect turf or expand their turf or anything that can and occur. so they were good people. <laughs> Oh, and what about liaison with the local community and the extension service? Do you have liaison with them too as well? 
the, the, uh, uh, I think you mentioned the state chemist's office, right, and yeah. I didn't expand on that. Okay. We've also had excellent working relations with the state chemist's office. Which is housed here on which campus. Which is right here on campus right. and has been for a long, long time. Right. The Indiana law reads such that if we believe that there's a poisoning event has taken place on a farm, it's necessary that a representative directly from a state chemist's office collect the samples on the farm. So the farmer can't just bring in the sample. Now he may bring the samples to us when we're looking for a diagnosis to start with. Okay, to but see. to verify that and have an official sample, the state chemist has to send someone there to collect those samples. They have been excellent for, well, the cooperation with the diagnostic lab has been excellent because over the years, um, they have much more chemical capabilities than we've ever had in diagnostic lab. That's their focus, the chemi chemical Pardon more. Me? That's their focus more Absolutely, chemical. yes. And so uh, we've, we've had just hand in glove uh, cooperation with, with the state chemist office as well. All right, good. The, what about Purdue Extension Service? Do you, um, what's the liaison there? I'm thinking of the researchers might because they know that term. We've had uh, on a number of instances where um, more than one of us in, in, in different cases have, have gone to county meetings usually to give talks about the diagnostic lab, how it works, and sure. how people submit samples and that kind of thing. When this PRRS uh, outbreak took place in the 90s, the uh, county extension agent up in Wabash County, he called special meetings, and uh, we went up there to talk to the hog farmers at that point in time about, because we didn't know what it was, but we did tell them that we recognize your plight and we're working on it. And uh, so I think it worked out very well. That's a good, that, you yeah. need that sense of assurance that somebody yep. is on top of it then, right. How about some of these outbreaks? And you have some challenges. One, the, um, you talked about one of them, but what about that West Nile virus that occurred? You know, media and <coughs> all kinds of things when these uh, are brought to the fore, you know. When, uh, when the West Nile virus first showed up, um, We've got a lot of horses in Indiana, and I, and I was trying to toss over my mind. Maybe I knew how many there were, but I guess I can't find that. But uh, obviously, horse population in the Amish area is very high because obviously they use these animals for work. And so uh, the governor at that time appointed a West Nile virus task force. And uh, Dr. Ralph Williams, who's an entomologist here at Purdue, and myself and uh, a representative from uh, the state veterinarian's office who was uh, Dr. Sandy Norman, we were appointed to that task force and, and we made visits to both uh, Knox County, which has got a rather large Amish population, and we visited up in, I can't remember whether it's St. Joe or Elkhart County, because there's a lot of Amish there as well. And we went there and probably the entomologist did more good on that task force than, than either of the rest of us because he made the, when we would go on these farms where the horses were affected, he would go around and, and look for places where the mosquitoes were breeding and, and uh, multiplying and tell those farmers, here's how you, you need to take care of, of this mosquito breeding area to lower, to get rid of the, the transmitting agent, which was the mosquitoes that carried the virus to the horses. Um, a lot of times this would be drooping eaves troughs or standing water in horse troughs or that kind of thing to get rid of it. And uh, I think that had an effect. Yeah, it was a good addition to the team and that hit the source and they could Absolutely. tell people about because they were pretty, yeah. pretty knowledgeable. The uh, mad cow disease was another one, right? That was a We've, uh, <clears throat> oh, now I'm trying to remember what year that was. 99. But in I 1999, know. Right. that was given a nickname of the cow that, that dis destroyed, kit, that <laughs> ruined Christmas. Right. Um, because that cow was found in, in Washington, and for whatever reason, there was some national... Uh, media somewhere that got my name on this thing and our our phone rang that whole Christmas vacation because 
Uh, apparently they had trouble getting hold of someone who knew something about uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And right. so yeah. we got to spend that whole Christmas uh, pretty well on the telephone talking to media around the country. Yeah, and yeah. and that, that was a good thing sure. because uh, having mad cow, having been found in the United States, that could have a very deleterious effect on the cattle prices in this country. But because I think um, people were open, the government was very open in, in providing of information. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ron DeHaven at that point in time, who was a Purdue Veterinary School graduate, as a matter of fact, was, um, a very, was number two, I think, in the USDA. And he gave a number of talks to national media about the control that the uh, government was putting through to make sure that mad cow disease was not getting into the meat supply of this country. The upshot of that being that uh, all that hullabaloo and all that damage that could have been done to the cattle industry in this country didn't happen. Uh, because cattle people were up, cattle were prices didn't it. go down yeah, because the consumption about. didn't go down right. hardly at all. Right, yeah. Another one was that uh, the pet food contamination thing. Did you get a lot of calls on that? We did. Okay. Um, there was um, Dr. Steve Hooser, who is now the director of the Animal Z Diagnostic Lab, is a toxicologist. And he was considered to be one of the experts in the country. Um, also, uh, the, uh, for the testing on this, a lot of this was done in Procter & Gamble's facilities down in Cincinnati to pick up the melamine that uh, was coming in on the pet food from, from China at that point in time. Right. And uh, so they got on top of it pretty quickly. Sure. And there was a, a, an extensive list of pet food manufacturers that their products shouldn't be used. And uh, that, I really that, don't know how many animals right. succumbed to that. But uh, it that could have been much worse. That listing was very good because being the owner of two cats, I checked it to be sure that what, yeah. what I was, with the numbers and everything, so they were really up front and got the word out so that you could really check it either online or in the newspaper. The right. online was very handy and very right. helpful. Of course, then last year we had the H1N1 virus. Right. Did you get some inquiries on that too? or? Oh, some. Okay. Um, I think... Um, there was the worst thing about this was, in, in my estimation, that, that the federal government didn't handle this one very well because they called it swine flu. And that did have an effect um, on the consumption of pork in this country because it, wasn't, it was no problem to turn on the TV. Don't touch it, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, that's what happened. That's right yeah. because they kept calling it swine flu, and it wasn't swine flu. It was actually. It was actually human flu is what it amounted to. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, how about that uh, you had your 50th anniversary, the school did, and the Dog Days Art Project. Right. That, that worked nice. out very, very well. Yes. Um, they, they, you had some involvement in that too, huh? Well, not, so. not a lot. That, that mainly came from our development office in the veterinary school. But it was a nice, and it unfortunately, was. some damage occurred. It really <laughs> was. And uh, there was some vandalism that took place because they put the the uh, dogs after they were painted and and people did an excellent job with they that. Sure did. And they had these uh, fiberglass dogs that were put out in various locations right. and and they were some of them were vandalized and that kind of thing. But it even the vandalism got publicity and so the vet school got and some got good the, publicity. That's right. Out of the it. one that was damaged came back to one be of them repaired. Came, they they had the leg broken off of it, so they took the dog to the <laughs> to veterinary the vet hospital <laughs> and. Uh, and did some splinting on that, and so it, it <laughs> what got publicity been better? also. <laughs> oh, let's talk a little about the dean. So when you came, was Erskine Morris the dean in, uh, in Stockton? Or? He was when I went through veterinary school. Oh, okay. When I got back to veterinary school, it was Dean Jack Stockton. Okay. And, then, and uh, Dr. Stockton and I got along very well. Yeah. Um, he was he was a, a good leader. Okay. And, and then in, I think it was 85 that uh, Hugh Lewis came. Right. And uh, Hugh and I got along very well. We were about the same age, I guess, or are about the same age. And uh, he had been in practice before he came to be a, a dean of the veterinary school. Sure. And so we, we related pretty well. And, and then following uh, 
Dean Lewis uh, was Al Rebar, and Al Rebar and I had been in graduate school together, uh, so we had a connection there. Got the family there. there. <laughs> That's right. And then Elias Sim was in for a period of time, and, uh, and I think that was interim most all that time, but then he was followed up with Willie Reed, right. and Willie Reed was one of my graduate students, and so uh, that's worked out very well, sure. and Willie's doing, a, yeah. doing an excellent job. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about the library. That facility has really changed a lot, but you remember when the library got started, even when you were a student there, right? Yes, Ann Kirker, Ann the Kirker was, was our librarian. Up a land land job with the facility that she had. And That's exactly right. I remember right. one time she told me that Dean Stockton gave her some room up in the eaves or in the something, you know, but she used them for, she used it. <laughs> Absolutely. That was probably up above in the, at, in the right. old hayloft. Right. Uh, in the building where my office is now. As a matter of fact, uh, the office I have is the same place that I interviewed for veterinary school in in 1950. 1960, I guess it was. So <laughs> that brought back a lot of memories as well. But that building, the old Vet Path building, had a hay mow because at one point in time there were animal rooms in there. there. Okay. And they stored hay in that mound to uh, feed the animals down on the first floor. Sure. And so Ann Kirker was using some of that space in that old <laughs> hay mound to store books and what have you. I think she did mention that one Absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Oh. Um, let's see, were you, a, were you a faculty fellow at any of the residence halls? No, I didn't have that opportunity. Okay, let's talk a little about your family. Um, yeah. Well, we uh, started our family, as I say, the year before I vet, left veterinary practice in Kentucky, and so Chad was a year old when I came back here to graduate school, and then uh, in 1975, before I had finished my Ph.D., uh, our second son, Matthew, was born, and then in 1980, on February 29th, um, our third son was born, and then our fourth was a daughter who was born in March of 82. Okay. So, uh, how does they, the 29th celebrate the birthday? That must well, be usually he, he gets to pick whether he wants to do it on the 28th or the 1st, but on the 29th, we usually have a very, very good celebration. There are not many people around that have that, no, that injury. No, <laughs> no, most of us can look around and we say, well, out of every 365 people, somebody else has got the same birthday, <laughs> right. but, but he, he doesn't say that. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, you got the President's Award. You're talking about awards and honors from the uh, Indiana Veterinary Medical Association. That's very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, um, that same year, they they elected me to be the Indiana Veterinarian of the Year. And how did that? Uh, what did 2009? that entail? 2009. Well, it was just it was just an honor that uh, I was very humbled to to receive that. Really. Let me ask you this, how did you find it? Did you know in, in advance a little bit or not? Sometimes not at I all. ask people that. Not at all. How did it, they just announced <laughs> it? Yeah, they, they start reading off what the, the uh, credentials and background of the person who won it, and after they give a few things, you start thinking, well, that might be me. <laughs> <laughs> I fit in some of those boxes, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> I fit in some of those boxes. <laughs> oh, you've still been active. You're still active in what, the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association yes. and American Association of uh, Veterinary Labor Laboratory Diagnosis? Yeah, I was uh, the, vet the American Association of Veterinary Laboratory Diagnosticians, uh -huh. AAVLD. Yeah. They are the accrediting body for all of the veterinary diagnostic labs around the country. And I had the opportunity of being the chairman of the accreditation committee for about 10 years. Good. And so that was, uh, that was quite an experience. I we bet get, it was. We get an opportunity to see the laboratories in, in all states, uh, have been in, in most of them. Um, and we're not the only one that has a good diagnostic lab because every time we made a visit, you, you learned something else sure. that you could bring back and put into the our laboratory. Yeah, right, okay. How about, uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Oh, uh, we, we, uh, we very much like Purdue football and Purdue basketball. Okay. And uh, so those are, those are things that, that, with, that we with watch With peaks and valleys. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. I had, uh, some of our relatives have been Cubs fans also, <laughs> so we can understand. <laughs> How about an outstanding event? Oh. 
I've had, I've had so the opportunity well, of having have, so you, many. I, people say one. I said you can have more than one. <laughs> it's okay. Well, uh, got an opportunity the year before China joined the World Trade Organization. I had an opportunity to go there and, and talk to them about swine diseases, and and that was that was uh, uh, a, a very high honor I thought, and and you a very enjoyable the, time. How long were you there? Did you visit some of the schools over there? And only one of the schools, okay. um, and got to speak to uh, a number of people who were in the swine industry, as well as there were some who were had both the swine industry representation and poultry. Um, so it wasn't necessarily good news that I was taking to China, because China had the idea that when they joined the, world, the WTO that they were going to be sending pigs all over the world. But the problem is they've got a lot of diseases. And so most of the countries of the world were going to be closing their doors to China. And they weren't necessarily wanting to hear that, but that's what I that's went to tell them. Right. And, and so um, I'm not too sure how much uh, success they've had in bringing some of these catastrophic diseases under control. But uh, as long as they've got them, a number of other countries are not going to want their p pigs is what's going to amount right. to. Yeah. Now let me, let's go back to uh, you're the interim director at the moment, or well, I'm an time. interim department head oh, okay. in the veterinary school. Okay. Uh, so I, I was um, out of the being the director of the diagnostic lab in August of 2008. Okay. And so, but I'm you're the now interim, interim head for the department. Interim department head. Okay. Now, I was I was department head and the director from 1996 until 2002. So about six years, I had two jobs. Okay. And, um, well, uh, some of the students, uh, where are they? In many that that are in this, uh, say, animal disease. What sort of jobs do they do? They go into industry or government, or do some go uh, in the pathology group right, or out yeah. of the veterinary school. Out of the veterinary and pathology from the the from pathologists. Um, we still have a number of students who go in and go to work for drug companies doing drug safety okay. evaluations, um, but there's. We've had more probably in the last few years who went into either academia to teach pathology or into a diagnostic situation like we have in uh, the animal disease diagnostic lab okay. there. It's, uh, it's a very broad education in pathology. Um, pathology essentially is a study of disorders of animals and so um, People who come out with pathology degrees, they have an opportunity to work in, in clinics or diagnostics. It's, it's just a, a wide range of... There's a number also who end up going into administration. Uh, my first graduate student is the dean of the vet school in Auburn. So uh, they, they often end up in, in administrative jobs and uh, it's just a wide range wide of what range they can of go that into. They want to do. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm going to, how about a look at, uh, I'm going to let you wrap it up and make any things, something I may have forgotten to ask, or I'll leave it up to you. One of the things, uh, Catherine, right. that you asked me to think about, right. one of the most unique things that we had okay. when I was in veterinary school, we had a class, we took a class of 50, and uh, we had a pharmacology instructor. Pharmacology is where we study the drugs that we were going to use. We had a pharmacology instructor by the name of Dr. Richard Hughes. Now, Dr. Hughes came in at the end of the first semester, and he said, okay, here's the way your examination for this semester is going to work. He said, I'm going to come in here with a fish bowl. And he said, in this fish bowl are going to be the names of all the drugs we've studied this semester. And he said, I'm going to divide this class into groups of 10. So there's going to be 10 students here, 10, 10. And he said, I'm going to reach into this fishbowl and pull out the name of one of the drugs we've studied. And number one in this first group is going to get to ask me a question that I can answer yes or no and then it's going to go to the next person in this line and he gets to answer yes or no and by the time it gets to number 10 you have to write down what that drug is 
Now, our class was either going to all pass on this or we were all going to fail because you had to, you had to be total cooperation. Everybody knew I had to know which question to ask and what that meant. So the first thing it did was there were a number of us got a big sheet and we started making this flow chart. And we'd make this flow chart and the first question was always, does this drug affect the central nervous system? Because at that time we had studied an anesthetics and we, um, analgesics. So the first question was always, does this drug affect the central nervous system? If the answer to that was yes, then you went, does this drug depress the central nervous system? That was the second one. And on down the line, so then you knew what the question was, you knew what the drug was. But that was a tremendous exercise, and Sorry. everybody in the class had to participate, and everybody in the class had to be able to close your eyes and see that flow chart. It was just the most unique examination I ever took and or ever heard of. And we're and it's just great. It stuck it with was. you. It was. And everybody passed. That's great. And there were only We all worked together. <laughs> that's right. And there were only a few times during that entire examination where somebody would ask the wrong question. And if they asked the wrong question, then everybody else in the class would go, shh, because we knew we'd wasted a question. <laughs> but it was, it was a fun oh, time. Yeah, good. Uh, any closing comments or looking ahead or behind? Uh, only that uh, Purdue's been a great place. Uh, our, uh, Did your children go to Purdue? We had two that went to Purdue. One went uh, in through the School of Management. He went um, a couple of different places working for plastics, and he ended up in California. And just two years ago, he finished up a MBA at UC Irvine. Okay. Number one in his class. We were very proud of him. Our second son went to Ball State, got a degree in uh, elementary education. He teaches seventh grade math in Raleigh, North Carolina. He does, a, he does a great job with it. Our son in California's got three daughters. Our son in North Carolina just recently had a son, so he's about two months old. And then our third son got a degree from Purdue in engineering, and he went to work for Honda in Marysville, Ohio. And while he was there, he pursued a uh, MBA at Ohio State. Uh, and finished that, and uh, it was an excellent experience he had working for Honda. Have you ever seen the Element, Honda Element? He helped design that. So um, after he got his MBA, he started looking around, and he took a job with Procter & Gamble, and he worked in Procter & Gamble for about three years. In Cincinnati? In Cincinnati, and then he decided that that wouldn't fit him very well, so he answered an ad for Accenture. So he's now working for Accenture and traveling all over the world um, and living out of Indianapolis. Okay. He's going to get married April 16th, so that'll be our last one. And our daughter lives in uh, our, our fourth, which is our daughter Mindy, lives in uh, Dallas, Texas. And she and her husband are essentially in a domestic mission field. Uh, they they uh, have kids from kind of the, the slum area of western of West Dallas into their house all the time, and they work for a mission called um, Mercy Street. And Mercy Street's aim is to pair up people, couples, with children out of um, underprivileged area of West Dallas. And those people essentially make an eight-year commitment to see that youngster through high school. They've got about 500 children in that program, and uh, it's, it's very tiring. I mean, they, they've got kids in and out of their house constantly. And they've got our, our fourth granddaughter is there, and we just got back from visiting them. Okay. She's 16 months, and she's a joy. <laughs> oh, sounds good. Okay, any uh, final things, or do you think uh, we uh, I just appreciate the opportunity coming. Okay. And, and I thank you for listening. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, thank very you. much. Thank <clears> you. <throat>